Welcome to Beyond BIM. I am delighted to bring to you today's guest, Associate Professor Zulfikar Adamu. Zulfikar is an Associate Professor of Strategic IT in Construction at the London South Bank University. He is best known for his work on BIM, digitization of construction and design, but more recently, his article posted on LinkedIn has gathered an insurmountable amount of interest. The topic he discussed in this article and in my interview is on COVID-19 and the spread of bioaerosols in an indoor environment. Specifically, how human behavior and building design in particular can indeed accelerate this spread. We even venture down the contentious topic of wearing masks. His interest and knowledge on the subject stems from his earlier PhD work, which was originally developed at the time when MERS and SARS first erupted. He studied the topic to understand how hospital design in particular can impact the spread of pathogenic aerosols. In our discussion, he sheds light about the impact of building design and HVAC systems on the spread of pathogenic aerosols. And now let's take a listen to Zulfikar on how building design, human behavior may impact the spread of pathogenic bioaerosols. could just tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background and what initially got you interested in the digitization of the built environment in the first place and then how your research has um, further on moved into the domains of better design of hospitals as well. By, by training and, and background, I am an architect. I, I trained as an architect uh, with a bachelor's and a master's and like every typical architect I've prepared at some point to go into practice. But I think towards my, my, when I was doing my master's research and dissertation, I, I fell in love with um, the engineering side of things. I think I took some modules on building services in my undergraduate and I always wanted to explore the indoor environment, what makes things work apart from the aesthetics and the functional layout. So I got interested in indoor air quality and thermal comfort. And when I was finished my master's, I said, you know, I need to explore this a bit further. So I did another master's in architecture engineering where I looked deep, uh, more closely into um, indoor air quality. And then, yes, I liked it. And at that point, I spent a few more years in academia than my typical colleagues. So it wasn't surprising that I decided to go for a PhD. So, yeah, so I, I went for a PhD at Loughborough University where I did, um, when I saw the topic of the uh, uh, of the PhD topic for my supervisors, I knew this was meant for me because it had all the ingredients. It had indoor air quality, it had thermal comfort, it had energy, it had CFD simulation, and it quite some more or less from the architectural background. So I spent time about three good years of my life looking into uh, uh, airborne infection in hospitals in terms of how we can we manage this problem in an energy efficient way using natural ventilation. So we're trying to make it energy efficient, but also want to uh, make sure that uh, at that time it was uh, 2009 onwards, it was the swine flu period, you know. So there's quite a lot of concern that um, some of these uh, pathogenic um, bioaerosols from swine flu emissions so that were harming healthcare workers around the world. So uh, my research was basically how do we protect healthcare workers as well as maybe visitors and um, other people who may be stakeholders who might come around um, the health, health, health uh, hospital environment. So that was, that's, that's my background and how I got into the um, indoor air quality side of things, if you like, or healthcare side of things. So obviously there's a lot of interest. I mean, everybody is talking about this in the news and of course academics are disputing and discussing about the very same topic that you uh, started your research out in. So could you shed some more light on how pathogenic bioaerosols are distributed within hospital wards or physical spaces? Okay, um, so let's start from the, um, the sources of, uh, I'm not going to go into the biology of how bioaerosols uh, come about, but from the emission side of things, bioaerosols, um, especially pathogenic bioaerosols, let's try to be very clear because we generate bioaerosols, but they might not be pathogenic. They are generated from uh, basically four main routes. We have the sneezing, we call them pulmonary activities, activities that have to do with your lungs, from sneezing and from coughing and from talking as well as from breathing, in roughly in that order of uh, reduced intensity because when you sneeze, you emit an awful lot of aerosols compared to talking or, or, or breathing and, and the rest of it. 
Um, but the interesting thing is that in terms of emission, of course, you can you can tell from the um, from the uh, description of these routes that some of them are probably more um, forceful than the rest. A sneeze, a sneeze is, quite, is called a violent emission in, in, in technical terms. And when you sneeze, you are emitting like 100,000 to a million droplets or from, the, from your nose. You know what I mean? Um, these are, um, you know, moisturized droplets. Some of them yeah. might fall on the floor. Some of them might uh, go a little bit far. They can go as far as, say, eight meters away. But the typical distance will be maybe two to three meters when you sneeze. The distance to which the particles will be dropped. Um, but then some of them will float in the air. Okay. okay. A few minutes or sometimes for hours. If it's a stagnant room, it's unsurprising that it might float in the air for a while. If it's a very well-ventilated well room, it might be moved from one part of the room to the other or maybe exhausted or through a window or whatever. So that's a sneeze. A cough is slightly similar, but maybe with less intensity. And then talking and breathing are also... Uh, routes through which you are emitting micro particles. I mean, you, you must have come across one or two people who, when they talk, they kind of spit a little bit. I don't know, but I think I'm those this kind of people. So, yeah, people we do emit uh, micro particles, moisturized forms, and they, yeah. may, they may not be deposited, they may float in the air. It all depends on the size of the particles. Now, in terms of infection, um, from say things like flu, if you have um, some disease of some sort, then those particles might carry those viruses and emit them, and then they get deposited onto other people or they breathe them in. And we've known this for quite a while, especially from the SARS epidemic of 2002. We've known that uh, these things can have some um, some airborne routes of, of infection. That's not to say this, they, they get to spread through airborne primarily, not necessarily, but uh, it's one of the routes. Apart from touching uh, contact for my routes, it could spread into um, the air where you're sitting with someone. And um, in fact, it is, it is known, for example, through research, that in terms of exposure, when you are talking, you might be emitting about 1,400 liters of air. If you are to quantify the volume of air you are emitting, some of that air is moisturized, remember? You are emitting 1,400 liters of exhaled air. When you're breathing, wow. two, yeah, when you're breathing for the same duration of two hours, you are generating around 1,600 liters hmm. of air. It's just a volume of air. Forget about whether it's contaminated or not. Yeah. By comparison, when you cough 100 times, you will generate only 120 liters of exhaled air. So you can see where the problem is in terms of uh, um, um, by aerosol emission and infection in a confined space. If I was sitting next to someone in a train for a one-hour ride, I'd be more concerned with the person who is breathing or talking quietly and he may be infected. I'd be more concerned than that than someone who is across and coughing because that's just a single emission. He's not going to cough 100 times, but the guy next to me might be breathing constantly. In fact, he'll be breathing constantly. What am I saying? And he might even be talking. You see my point? Yes. So yes. My, you know, this is one of the reasons that may be uh, why things like COVID-19 are spreading, you know, very rapidly because people are just looking at coughing and sneezing without realizing that um, talking and breathing can generate by aerosols. In fact, some research and stressing research that was done, I'm not too sure where it was. I can't remember. But it showed that even language has an impact on the way you emit some of these by aerosols. For example, wow. language have a lot of consonants like P. Yeah. You generate more by aerosols or more, 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 more of those liters of air because P by, by nature emits a kind of volume, more volume of air than say H or maybe T. P, if you think about the sound P, you're emitting air, isn't it? So some research has been done to show that the, the uh, I think the, the example that I was given was that if you were a waiter or a bartender, and you are attending to tourists, depending on the language that the tourists were speaking, whether it's Japanese or English, that bartender may be exposed to different levels of by aerosols by virtue of them just talking in their own language or their own accent. Have, have they actually gone to that minutiae of detail yeah. of actually categorizing which languages might be more? You'd be surprised what you find yes. out if you go to Google Scholar and just type airborne infection, which is why I'm, I'm surprised when people say we don't have evidence or it's weak science. I mean, we've known many things for decades but especially when it comes to pandemic flu in particular, because this, this emission has nothing to do with uh, flu alone. If you have tuberculosis, it's the same way you may emit tuberculosis through sneezing, coughing, because it, it doesn't only go through airborne, by the way. I'm just saying, if someone who had tuberculosis was to, was to infect other people, he might do it through sneezing, coughing, talking, or breathing. But with respect to pandemic flus, we've known for about a decade plus now, since 2002, that um, almost two decades, in fact, if you think about it, uh, that flus have a way of behaving, you know what I mean? And uh, coronavirus, which in technical terms, let's call it COVID-19, because even your normal seasonal flu can be caused by a type of coronavirus. Um, coronaviruses have a way of behaving when they are emitted 
through you know all the activities I've mentioned, sneezing, coffee, and the rest of that. Okay, so yeah, so people do have that level of detail. Researchers knew they have all the time in the world to investigate things that mere mortals will not necessarily go into, to investigate how much yeah. a baby will emit flu uh, and droplets or how much an elderly person, a sick person, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So they go to all levels of details to, 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 to the extent that they're looking at even the language or the accent of a person. That That's can, really can fascinating. Come. Yeah. Oh, yes, it is very fascinating. And so... With regards to the spread of these airborne particles within, let's say, the hospital environment, what I found most interesting in your recent article that you posted on LinkedIn was the discussion about the physical spaces and the HVAC systems and how, depending upon, obviously, the specifications and the designs, Mm -hmm. this will also have great impact on the spread of these airborne particles. Can you elaborate more on that specifically? Okay. All right. So when, when, when a particle is emitted, all right, now remember that these viruses do not have wings. So it's not like viruses. When they say a virus is airborne, it has wings and it flies. No, it just is carried along, along through particles that may float in the air. And I've already said that a lot of those particles will drop on the floor. Okay. And some of them might float. We call them microparticles of a certain size. They might float in the air for quite a while and they get carried away. They may be affected by the ventilation regime. Is it natural? Is it mechanical? Is it a fan in the room and, and the rest of it? Now, when they get carried away into the ventilation system, especially when it's mechanical, it means the HVAC system may carry, which HVAC means uh, heating, ventilation, uh, ventilation, and air conditioning system. The ducts may carry this, uh, pass some of these microparticles and distribute them into other rooms or other zones if they share the same HVAC system. Because remember, mechanical systems tend to uh, kind of uh, recycle it in, uh, in some ways. So this is where the danger could come in in terms of a healthcare space or even an office environment where you are using a centralized HVAC system and you're recycling um, contaminated air. But they do have filters, but they're not necessarily medical grade filters that might filter out all the particles. And remember, the ones that float happen to be the smallest anyway. So some of these filters might not necessarily catch them, except if they're like HEPA quality filters. Those are one of the finest quality filters you may have out there. So, and the way HVAC systems are designed is such that, if you think about it from a heating perspective, if you bring in fresh air from outside and you heat it up in a HVAC system, you are heating up the air and distributing into the room, okay? Now, yeah. when you are exhausting the stale air, you are not going to throw away all that warm air for energy efficiency reasons. You will recirculate some of the air. So you might discard, let's say 50% and return the many 50% of the warm air back by bringing an extra... F- to make up for that, you bring in fresh air of 50% from the outside. So that way, your air that's coming into the HVAC system, again, is pre-warmed. But that means if it has some contaminated particles, you might reintroduce it back into the system if the filtration is not very efficient. Okay? So this, to me, right. explains okay. one of the reasons. This is this is my hypothesis. That I think there's some interesting research going around. But like the, um, is it Diamond Princess, the uh, cruise liner, one of the major cases of outbreak? Yes. What yeah. people suspect, those who are into this field, they suspect this is one of the ways that uh, almost everyone, most of the people that got infected, even though they were told to isolate into their, their own rooms. You can't explain why they all got infected. It's, 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 it's difficult to say they all touch the same surface. I mean, it could happen, but people say it probably could be the HVAC system because in cruise liners, just like aeroplanes, you know, you might have uh, air conditioning systems and some of them may be recirculating air and, and the rest of it. So it's, it's quite an interesting uh, uh, tech, uh, um, sorry, uh, process of how you, from one emission of a cough or a sneeze, you might end up infecting hundreds, maybe thousands of people, you know, because of the air conditioning system. Now, and it's and what it. you're alluding to also is, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that specifically those systems that are designed to be more efficient, you're saying that due to this design in efficiency, whereby it's recirculating some of the air, this is actually potentially endangering well, people. Definitely. They are designed to be energy efficient. I know the energy efficiency design of uh, HVAC system started in the 1970s from the oil embargo. That's when HVAC engineers started saying, you know what, we need to make our, our air conditioning system a bit more efficient so that our buildings will be more efficient. We don't have to rely on fossil fuels that much. That was the first time the built environment specialists started being concerned about conserving energy to uh, in, on a massive scale. People were doing it historically, like Frank Lloyd Wright in the 19th century, but the first time the contemporary engineers and architects started thinking about energy efficiency was the, was the oil embargo period of the 1970s. HVAC systems, as we know today, have their roots in that period. Now, they were designed to make sure that we save energy. And to save energy means if you're cooling the air or heating the air, you don't throw away the coolness or the heating of the air. You try to recirculate it. If you could bring all of it back, do it. 
But of course, some of it will contain carbon monoxide, uh, carbon dioxide, might contain some other particles that are exhaled out or whatever. So you don't want to return all of it. So what designers do is that they have something called the outdoor air fraction. What fraction of outdoor air are, we, are you willing to bring in? So if you want to have an HVAC system that has 10% outdoor air fraction, which means 90% of the indoor air will be circulated to be supplemented by 10% from outside. But it might be typical to have 50-50, for example. But then again, remember I said there's, there are filters, and the efficiency of those filters may also determine the regime. So you might have one HVAC system that is exactly the same in one building as opposed to another building, let's say two hospitals. But the way they operate, the operational mechanism, the operational regime, of the HVAC system could be completely different. It depends on how much energy you were trying to save or something like that, but also how the spaces were designed or in, in terms of which space may be a source and which space may be a sink because in indoor air quality, we have sources and sink. A person coughing is a source. A person who's receiving that or a surface is a sink. This is where the virus might be deposited or, the virus, or any pathogenic material. So it depends on, uh, let's say in a hospital, uh, is your source um, uh, a, a bigger room that has more air supplied and removed into it as opposed to other rooms? You know what I mean? Or do you have more people who are infected in one room generating by aerosols and spreading to other parts of the building and so on and so forth? Yeah. So yes, this is, this is something that's very, very important. And, and some of these are some of the professional bodies that are looking into these things in detail, like the SIPCs and the archeries, they do come up with very, very rigorous uh, guidelines about how uh, 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 engineers and architects might design their spaces to make sure that uh, they deal with uh, pathogenic aerosols, with or without pandemic flu, is something we've always been concerned about anyway. So even despite, um, as you say, despite the pandemic flu, they do have to take into consideration the potential of harmful particles being recycled within the air? Is that well, what you're it's, saying? It's one of the most important things that a HVAC engineer will do because you don't mm. want to spread disease from one room to the next. Yes. Um, most people will think it's just isolation rooms that you need to be worried about. You don't want to bring in, for example, someone, now there are two kinds of isolation rooms. If you have someone with COVID-19, you put him in an isolation room, you put him in a negative pressure isolation room, which means the air is by default forced to come into that room. There's no way the air will be allowed to go out of that room, either through a HVAC system or even through the doors. You know what I mean? Which means if you had an isolation room for the COVID-19 patient, the corridor or the, the ante room to that isolation room will be pressurized. There'll be a lot of air pressurized into that room to make sure that any if a nurse opened the door to that isolation room, the air is generally forced to move into that isolation room because that air in that room is contaminated. This is a right. someone who had a knee surgery or whatever, and they want to protect them from harmful contaminants, in which case to be negatively pressurized. But I don't, I don't want to go into that detail. But generally, the way we design the rooms using pressure is something that HVAC engineers have had to deal with a, a, a long time. In fact, it's very important because... Uh, you know, we talk about pandemic flus and how maybe HVAC systems might contribute to them. But even without a disease per se, there's things like sick building syndrome that can be spread by HVAC system. For example, when you have a brand new office or a brand new house and that is just freshly painted with new furniture, new rugs and the rest of that, there's usually this smell that you might deduce, isn't it? Now, That's right. Is yeah. Something called off-gassing. Now, this is maybe the veneer or the polish of the wall or the paint giving off some gases. And these things might be spread around and they may make people feel a little bit sick. That's why it's called sick building syndrome. You might not be able to detect exactly what's causing it, but usually when you leave that building, you feel okay. When you come back to that building, you kind of feel, I'm always feeling lethargic, I feel nauseatic and the rest of that. So mm. HVAC systems have always played a role. They could help in spreading um, uh, um, um, contaminants around the building, but they might also be helpful, like I explained in the pressurization, they might be helpful in stopping the spread. If you design this strategy very well, you can actually use air. The funny thing is that when it comes to airborne infection, the root of infection is air. But one of the easiest and the most effective ways of stopping it is also the same air. Because you can just make sure you direct the airflow the way you want it. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I see. But then, obviously, in, in the more recent research work now, in light of the pandemic, it has involved a lot of digital modeling and simulation of these types of scenarios, yeah. I would assume. Mm -hmm. So can you shed some more light on how specifically uh, digital design tools and simulation tools have been used in this regard to sort of preempt mm -hmm. some of the spread of the airborne particles? Okay, now computational tools have always existed for a long time, but with respect to indoor air quality, there are about two major kinds of tools that you can use. There are tools that just give you uh, a general information about the level of contamination in the room or level of temperature or whatever. You know what I mean? These are called like dynamic thermal modeling tools, but there are those that are very specific like uh, computational fluid dynamics. 
uh, which go into the level of detail of where these contaminants may be spread. Let me put it this way. If you use a dynamic thermal simulation tool to simulate something in a room, it may give you distribution over time. It will tell you, well, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., this is the amount of whatever CO2 that was in the air. But it doesn't tell you distribution across the space because these things are not evenly distributed. So you need tools like CFD that will go a little bit more deeper. They give you qualitative data in terms of the contours of spread of temperature or, 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 or contaminants and the rest of that. So these are the two most common tools that are used. Um, but then again, there are other techniques that are a bit computational, but they may not be necessarily be computerized. You know what I mean? There are other techniques like uh, um, scale models where we, we simulate the curve using some equipment and the rest of that. They, they, they include some computational techniques as well. So for example, in my, in my PhD, I use both dynamic thermal simulation and I use computational physics dynamics. And I also have some sort of salt bath water modeling just to validate the ventilation system. Uh, but that's not something we want to go into. So CFD is one of the most powerful tools. Uh, unfortunately, right. people don't understand the way CFD works. In fact, I've read some articles on LinkedIn where people were like criticizing, oh, now with COVID, I've seen so many CFD simulations. In fact, someone went as far as saying, we have had enough of all these CFD simulations, people should stop it. You see, it's just a tool. It depends on how you use it. See my point? Um, yes. Yeah. So what is the major criticism then around? Well, people don't understand that. First of all, you need to have a validated CFD software to use. You can't just use any CFD software that is just commercially available out there. You have to be careful. This is one thing. And like any other computational process, whether it's word processing or Excel work or whatever, garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't put the right inputs, you don't get the right outputs. And whatever right input you put, remember, you're only capturing a specific scenario in terms of the boundary conditions of the building or the room you're simulating, the assumptions you're making, how many occupants are there, you are more or less mimicking a particular snapshot in time. So when you interpret CFD results, you need to understand that the CFD result is a solution or an explanation, not the solution or the explanation, which means this is one way that this might be behaving in the real world. Because otherwise, you have to model all kinds of scenarios. I'll give you an example. Some of the input parameters you want to put in a same simulation include the temperature of the room, the number of occupants, the amount of heating and lighting equipment, and the rest of that, the velocity of air, the direction of flow. So you're only capturing usually one scenario at a time. But the number of occupants may change. In fact, it will change. More nurses and doctors might come into a room and leave, isn't it? Correct. It will change. The temperature will change over time, across the day, across the weeks. So when people simulate in CFD, they don't have they don't have the time and resources or the need to model every possible scenario. They usually look at worst case scenarios or some interesting scenarios that they want to look at and capture that. But then those who don't understand why how CFD works assume oh this is this can't be correct because this is wrong. No, you are not maybe expect, uh, understanding that result very well, or maybe the person who is doing the work is not explaining it very well. It's not to say when I model, let's say if I use CFD to model what's happening in Northern Line or the Bakerloo Line. You know what I mean? It's a tube uh, 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 compartment. It doesn't mean this is exactly how it should behave all the time because it depends on the speed of the train, it depends on the temperature of the train, the number of occupants, there's so many things. So I, I can't do all. I just have to capture as much as I can in, in terms of an interesting scenario that may be used to deduce and make and draw some kind of conclusions about how that uh, space behaves under uh, certain ventilation regimes. So that is with simulated tools, right? But if we take the current hospitals that are actually dealing with managing the spread of some of these pathogenic aerosols, what are their biggest challenges in terms of trying to mitigate that spread? Okay. The biggest challenges hospitals will face, in my opinion, and I'm an architect, so I think I can speak a little bit authoritatively about this, is the design. The design of contemporary hospital, in fact, the design of contemporary buildings was not des- was not meant to tackle pandemic foods. Let's just accept that. I don't know how yes. this is going to be teaching of architecture going forward, but we now know we don't have buildings that can cope with massive influx of patients who have pandemic foods to start with. So the architecture is a big challenge. The second challenge is the um, the mindset of those who operate and use these buildings because we still have that energy conservation mindset. We are more interested in saving energy because we don't tend to have outbreaks of diseases that often. You know what I mean? And usually it's mm. contained. But when you have a flu or a, 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 a pandemic like it's affecting almost every country in the world right now, it tells you that we all need to work together and understand that um, the way we've operated these buildings needs to change. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes like HEPA filters are only used in specific rooms. Do we need to have more HEPA filters everywhere? Maybe we do. Okay. 
Um, so the way, um, what I'm saying is that those issues I talked about HVAC systems and saving energy out of fractions, the way we used to run HVAC systems, uh, typically we'll probably need to um, be, be, be reconsidered again. We need to reflect again about it. The last time I think the global community and indoor air quality looked into this matter in a closer detail was when just shortly after 9-11, at that time, the US in particular was worried about uh, CBR, last chemical, biological and uh, radiologic um, attacks. And that was roughly around the time I was doing my master's in architectural engineering. And they were worried that, I, I don't know if you remember, there was a time anthrax was actually being used to cause harm around um, uh, the world in some, some locations. So the, the HVAC community got together and tried to come up with some very wonderful guidelines that I remember reading, how we can protect, for example, the source of outdoor air we bring into the HVAC system, how we recirculate the air, but we kind of dropped the ball or maybe that threat went away and we never really worried about reinvigorating or redesigning or rethinking our HVAC strategies. You might have a wonderful HVAC system, but if you don't operate it in the best possible way, it will not deliver the result. So buildings are one thing, HVAC is second thing. And I think the third challenge in my opinion is the people. Um, maybe probably the most important because unfortunately, uh, again, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not trying to point fingers, but let's just face it. We talk about personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. From my own point of view, as an indoor air quality specialist of some sort, when you try to protect a healthcare worker using PPE from airborne infection, you are too late. It has already got to the level of protecting someone at the point where he will get directly infected. In, in engineering studies, whether it's acoustics or energy, when, when you have a problem, you try to solve it at the source, not at the sink. So if I have noise pollution problem, I don't try to block my ears. That's a waste of time and energy. I try to stop the noise from starting in the first place. I go to the source and stop it there. If I can't, then I try to uh, maybe put some barriers like trees and walls. If I can't, then I try to insulate my walls and windows to make sure they sound true. The last thing I should be doing is to have this noise pollution every day and I'm using an air morph to protect myself. That's, that's not the way to go about it in the engineering perspective. And this applies to many fields of engineering. We solve problems as sources. So when I see the emphasis on personal protective equipment, these are helpful, don't get me wrong, I'm saying too many people are relying on protecting themselves at the last possible layer. In in that instance, then, are you saying that they should also have considered potential fit outs or changing the filter types? Is that uh, also that. a potential? Now, I don't want to go too much into that. I'll just give you a simple example for the sake of the audience. What they could do, for example, is say things like face masks. If more people wore face masks, more healthcare workers will be safer. More general public will be safer. All of us. But you see, the problem is. We were told at the beginning of this pandemic, especially in this country, that oh, health face masks are only useful or necessary for healthcare workers. They don't provide benefit for the general public. You can, I'm not, you can, I'm paraphrasing. But I'm sure if you went to many websites, government mm -hmm. websites, um, public media outlets, you see a lot of statements being put out. The general public do not need to wear face masks. This was at the start of the pandemic, up to the peak. Now all of a sudden we're getting out of the lockdown, and they're told, we are told, if we don't wear face masks, now we're going to be fined in buses and trains. It makes you think. Hang on a second. This was something you told us wasn't necessary for the general public. All of a sudden, towards the end, it's now mandatory. Many and, airports will not take you in if you don't wear face masks. Many buses won't let you in if you don't wear face masks. Is this something that you also looked into when you were doing your PhD and your research on the topic? Obviously, at that time, you I, were... I didn't look into face masks in particular, but I read a lot of literature around that because, like yes. I said, the best way to stop something as a source. So one of the things I looked at was when I was modeling, for example, a cough or a sneeze in my hospital ward, I did not use a face mask because I assumed worst case scenario. But if I had a mask, you see, the, the interesting thing about face mask is that they protect the general people around from the, the emission. You might still emit something, but the speed, the intensity, and the distance of travel will be significantly reduced by a face mask. So it, it, mm. it makes you think we could have yes. made measures, we could have done certain things with face masks to make sure that at least the healthcare workers do not have to worry that much. The general public do not have to worry that much. Look, let me tell you something. Even for a family, we, I know of healthcare workers who went home and infected their, home, their, their family members, and some of those healthcare workers died. If those healthcare workers were encouraged to wear face masks even at home, they'd be helpful. If those uh, um, family members were also encouraged to wear face masks, they would protect their fellow family members. Because the face mask can help in the sense that it can stop the emission from source or it can protect the recipient, the sink I mentioned earlier. So which means even if it gets to you, even if you breathe it, you, the chances are that you are breathing probably less than you would normally have breathed it in if you didn't have the face mask. Because it, 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 it's the dose that makes the poison. You see my point? So you need right. the quantity of any infectious material to make you sick. Just because you're infected, you are exposed to a certain virus, for example, does not necessarily mean you'll be sick. 
So if the quantity, there's something called the Wells Riley model in indoor air quality that looks at those infection kind of rate and it predicts how infected you will be depends on the concentration or the toxicity of the disease. For example, tuberculosis is very toxic. It's more toxic than normal flu. COVID-19 is more toxic than normal flu. So you'll be exposed to the same level of virus from seasonal flu. You might not get sick, but half or a quarter of that maybe from COVID-19 might make you sick. So this is about the concentration or the toxicity of the, of the pathogen. The second thing is the ex- time of exposure. You might be coming into contact with this in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a confined space that is maybe contaminated, but if it's just for a brief period, you might not necessarily be sick. This again is something that's established for, for decades. But if you keep coming, if a nurse, for example, keeps coming to a ward where she has patients that have tuberculosis or some other infectious material, and she keeps doing that maybe every one hour for five, six hours a day, she has, she's at a greater risk or he's at a greater risk of being infected as opposed to a visitor who just came in once and left. Okay, that makes, that does yeah. seem to make sense. And then if we look at the scientific literature, is there a consensus, a broad consensus around the need for face masks or is this still something under debate? Um, there are, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned now, there are a few outliers, a few people who are still saying, well, it might not be that helpful. Look, I don't, I'm not talking about that helpful, about any help will help. We've had over close to 50,000 deaths in this country. It just makes you wonder how many people might have been saved if the general population was asked to wear face masks. I remember the first time I got interested in this topic was when someone said, oh, because we don't want to run out of face masks that are needed for healthcare workers, which is why we don't really want to recommend them. True, we want to protect our healthcare workers. We value them. One of the most, most, most valuable things in this country is our NHS. However, the general public deserve to be protected as much as the healthcare workers as well. Because, hey, let's forget, let's not forget that the healthcare workers themselves are part of the general public. The nurse and the doctor in the hospital is a parent at home. So mm-hmm. by telling them not to use health face masks in non-clinical spaces, you are putting more people at, at risk. This is, this is my, my, my initial concern before I wrote that article, you see? So um, you could just say, hey, guys, you know what? We're going to make sure that um, the medical grade masks are only restricted to healthcare workers, okay? Yes. If you look at the case studies of countries like Czechoslovakia, where they made sure face masks was mandatory for everyone, people went into cottage industry mass production. It helped such to extent that I think they didn't even need to do any social distancing. If you look at countries like Asia, who may have had COVID-19 outbreaks, but they were able to quickly bring it down, is because they've had a culture of using face masks since SARS of 2002. So they were more prepared and more prepared. understood they the importance. Bird flu, swine flu. There was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that came about some years ago. So they've been dealing with epidemics that may not necessarily be global that people may not be aware of. But those who are interested in the subject know that this face mask wearing has been going on for quite a while in some of these countries. You see, in fact, in some of these countries, like in China in particular, uh, I think in Hong Kong and other parts of the world, it's almost offensive for you to be moving around without a face mask. People were like, what? You know, it's like an insult to society for you to be seen without a face mask. That's how serious they take that thing right now. Because they understand that you are not really protecting yourself, you're going to protect other people if everybody wears a face mask. But the, the narrative in this country was a little bit different. We were told, well, it's not that necessary, only healthcare workers need to wear it. Well, why is it now that everybody needs to wear it? Or why is it now we're being fined for not wearing it? If you're being fined today when the COVID-19 cases are going down, why were, why were we not being told we'd be fined when we were at the peak? When it was even more necessary to wear a face mask? You see my point? Yeah, that, that certainly... So, but I understand. Let me just add this caveat. I understand that, yes, those who are making some of these decisions are looking at evidences from different parts of the world. But my gut feeling, my, or my, my take on this is that, at the very least, to be on the safe side, to be, be cautious, you know, to say, we don't know much about this, but based on what we've seen in other countries, it might be better for some of you if you can wear a face mask. Like the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in America, when they came to that conclusion that face masks were helpful, you know what they said? Face masks made from any cloth is better than no face mask. Mm, yes. And that's the sort of language you start to hear right now. People are saying, yes. yes, you don't have to use medical grade face masks. So anything that, for example, that can reduce the velocity or the, the volume or the dist- travel distance of your emission is always helpful. Two meters is nice, social distancing. Two meters is nice. But if you are staying two meters in a confined space where the air is not moving that much, gradually the concentration will build up. So it don't matter if you're staying, like I said, it depends on how long you've been exposed. If I was staying two meters away from the next person in a Tesco lineup, I want to buy some groceries, I wouldn't be too worried. But if I was in a, in a train, in a carriage, and I was two meters away from someone, I would be worried because I know they're breathing. They're probably talking on the phone or something. I know it's a matter of time, the concentration in that place will build up and the average exposure that I'm exposed to will increase. The risk is increasing gradually. 
with time. You see my point? So let's not get tied away with this two meter distance. Two meters works well, I think, in an outdoor environment. Mm-hmm. In an indoor environment, I'll be very careful. If I was in a restaurant today, and just because the next table is two meters away, I would be concerned. Unless I believe, or I can tell that maybe uh, the room is well ventilated, the windows are quite open. I'll tell you one thing, Erica. One thing I'll never do until this thing is sorted is never get into a car that does not have all the windows wound down because I know too much about this topic to put myself in a confined space. And airplanes and, and public transportation, you're suggesting everybody should be wearing face masks. It's true, especially public transportation because you're going to be exposed. If you're taking a one-hour bus ride, even if the bus has only half the population, even if every row has only one passenger, at the end of the day, it doesn't take 10 people to infect the whole bus. You just need one person to keep emitting stuff for quite a while until you have that saturation point. Now, if the buses are well ventilated, that's a different story. But we know our buses, just like our buildings, are not designed to ventilate against airborne infection. This is the problem. If yes. you live in London, you notice one thing. Some of the, I think a lot of the London buses now, they block the front door where the driver is. They let passengers go in through the middle door. Right. Do that. But why? It's not like these people who come to tap in their, their cards I, I'm going to stand by the um, bus driver and infect him. No. But you see, the chances are that if you have 50 people get into your bus and they just say 10% of them, five of them have uh, maybe uh, asymptomatic or they're carriers of COVID, by mere coming close to the driver, he is unnecessarily exposed. There's a risk of him being exposed. And it just takes one or two you know, people to infect a whole bus, like I said. You don't need to have everybody being infected to, to cause damage. So there's some, there's some common sense things happening. And this is one of the things I'm, I, I, I like to see more of. You know, people don't have to wait for government guidance on every aspect of our life. The government doesn't tell us to eat three times a day, but we do because it's common sense to eat three times a day. So you yes. don't need to wait for someone to tell you or to put yes. in a legislation or an act of parliament to tell you to wear a face mask before you realize that, hey, you know what? This thing can be very helpful to me. That's I mean, right. that's the face mask, uh, face mask, masksavesalives.org is a website I'll encourage everyone to visit. And you can see the trend and the differences in infection rates and in death rates between countries that have used a face mask as opposed to countries that do not have a face mask policy. And it's astonishing. And back to the physical buildings and spaces where, I mean, we're seeing now the slight ease of the lockdown. And Mm -hmm. uh, obviously people are now, uh, in some instances, even returning back to work. Do you foresee that there might be an increase in fit-out work within office spaces and buildings as we're trying to cope and, and ease access to workplaces and other public spaces as well? Um, by fit-out, you mean like people you mean spread out more, more thinly? Yes, as in potential redesign of spaces and well, uh, addition of partition walls and such kind of small design fit-out measures. Okay. I'll be very surprised if we didn't have those measures. In fact, I'd be shocking if facility managers, home uh, building owners and clients and even the government doesn't take some serious consideration into the building. Because like I said, we, this is the first time in history that we, um, the mankind as a far as I know the last time we had this kind of scenario where the whole world was faced at the same time, the same time was probably uh, maybe Noah's flood. For those of you who know your Bible book stories, whatever, you know what I mean? For the first time, the whole world is facing the same time at the same time. And I'm just so pleased that when I go to my local grocery shop, I see plastic barriers now. The same thing you'll see in your post office. Mm. Remember those plastic yes. barriers? Most of my yes. local shops have put those plastic barriers. They're very helpful. But if I had my way, I could advise some of them also. You know, it would be nice if you could put a fan behind the cashier to blow the air away from you. That's, that's what right. about strategy. You might have a system in place, but if the strategy is not right, if the air, no matter how much you have the barrier, if the air is flowing towards the, the, the cashier, they are still going to be at risk. So the way you design the airflow regime matters. This is where air conditioning systems and ventilation design is very, very important because if it's airborne, then clearly we can use air to also uh, protect everyone. But apart from even blowing the contaminants away, Air also helps to dilute these contaminants. Again, the dose makes the poison. So the more, the, the, the more diluted um, airborne contaminants are, the, the better for everyone eventually. In fact, dilution is actually a strategy we use in indoor air quality to protect um, uh, people from getting infected by many things. Now, again, don't get me wrong, COVID-19, it's, 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 a bit, it's rather more toxic than your average flu. You know what I mean? But Again, like I said, in terms of what you're, what you're asking, I'm happy to see grocery stores making these decisions. If grocery stores can do this, so markets can maybe do certain things like that, then our offices need to be designed or we need to, we need to think about what we can do. Our classroom environments, you know, 
um, even the hospitals themselves, you know, yes. our, our, our trains, our buses, we may need to just retrofit them. I, I, I don't know what we'll, we'll do about this, but we need to sit down and rethink. Because, you know, Erica, the problem we have now is that COVID-19 is here to stay, unfortunately. It's not going to go away. When flus come about, they stay. We just end up developing immunity to them or we find a vaccine or some other treatment and we, mm. we just live within the population. But who's to say this is not going to be taken into COVID-25 and become more toxic in the next five years? We don't know. So the measures we take today, the lessons we learn today will help us. And this is why there's a stark difference between the Asian countries and the European countries. Because Asian countries have had to deal with SARS, like I said, swine flu, bird flu, and the rest of them. You know what I mean? And most of these are also caused by coronaviruses. You know? So they've had so, more experience. So- Sorry to interrupt. So in the Asian countries who have already experienced a, a considerable amount of this type of um, changes to their physical environment and workspaces, did they take measures within hospital designs to foresee something like this happening again? Um, I, I know from research that uh, air, air ventilation systems have been, you know, there have been a lot of effort, especially in places like Hong Kong, I think Taiwan and mainland China, where they've had issues of that SARS episode I talked about earlier, swine flu. I know they have two research that the measures have been taking place. Even some airlines have had to make some changes to the way um, their ventilation systems work. Okay. But now, how long term this are, how widespread some of these changes are, it's, it, because you see, design is a culture, isn't it? I don't think every designer out there is necessarily up to speed with the latest state-of-the-art um, results in terms of how best to design the space or how best to design air, airborne, um, for airborne mm. infection or something like that, you know? Because yeah. if you think about the typical architects graduating today from university, whether in London or in Hong Kong. I mean, what, what is he necessarily trained in a better way to deal with this sort of thing than his contemporary of 20 years ago? I'm not sure. Do you think that it's uh, going to let's say from the educational side and point of view, that it's going to have to also be embedded into the curriculum where we're doing some more no. interdisciplinary work with epidemiologists and uh, physicists, for instance? Definitely, I think it would be a shame if we don't build this into our curriculum to start to educate more people. Because again, um, we're going to have, look, you know, but the funny thing was when I used to make my, when I do, was doing my PhD, I used, to, I used to say, oh, we have bird flu, swine flu, who knows, we might have crocodile flu in the future. Um, pandemics will be happening. They've always happened over time in history. The difference now is that because of air travel, globalization, they spread faster. In fact, they used to be epidemics. Now they become pandemics. You know what I mean? So yeah. these things will happen, whether we like it or not. Okay? Why they happen, where they start from, is a different matter. Now, because we kind of have that sort of certainty or plausibility that this will happen again, it will be a shame if we do not learn practically as professionals or even build into the curriculum of the next generation of architects and engineers. In terms of how we work, definitely I'd like to see a situation where we better understand and respect each other's work in terms of collaborative um, design, but also collaborative teaching. Because like you, I'm a BIM enthusiast and we BIM supposedly about collaboration, but there's just too much misunderstanding about what collaboration entails. People think bringing experts uh, of different professions and giving them some kind of digital platform to collaborate means they will collaborate. No. Collaboration, first of all, is a mindset. If you don't have the mindset to collaborate, no matter what tool you're giving, you will hold information. You will not respect the other professional. Mm. You know, one of my greatest um, 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 role models in built environment is Edward Newton. He's a uh, 19th century British architect. And he said, build information is like writing a letter to a builder, telling him exactly what you want him to do. So when we design, when we produce design information, all of us in the built environment, we are all writing letters to the contractor telling him how we should build that thing. It's important that we listen to everybody's contribution to that letter. Even if someone, if you're writing a letter, if someone's job is just to put punctuation, that is as important as the guy who composed the, 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 the text itself. Because without punctuation, it won't make much sense. But unfortunately, we have a culture where we hold information. We don't necessarily respect some professions in terms of collaboration because we think they're irrelevant or they're trivial. The QS is as important as the architect of tomorrow because the insight he'll give you at the onset of the project, it's as valid as whatever the architect might want to contribute. But because the traditional procurement method does not necessarily give everyone the same level playing field, we tend to have certain professions who are kind of relegated. So I like to see more collaboration in the sense that people's mindset needs to change. Collaboration starts from the very first minute. It is not after the architect had made the building rectangular 
that you start to invite everybody else to contribute to it. It's mm. not after you've mm. made a floor three meters high. It's too late for the engineer to come and start changing things because most times they try to work with what the architects have produced. But an architect will benefit from a, an indoor environmental quality person or a building physicist telling him, oh, you know what, that curvature you made is not necessarily good from an energy perspective or from an airflow perspective. That's when feedback is useful from the very first line, not after we made conceptual designs and we've already de- decided things and we're now forcing the other professionals to make it work. They might make it work, but it will be more costly or not very effective. But if everyone was involved from the beginning, it will help. Now, why am I dwelling on this? Because as an academic, I like to see the way we teach professionals change. We teach students in the built environment, more or less a kind of siloed approach. The architects are learning their profession separately. The civil engineers are kind of learning things separately. They might meet in one or two modules, but I like to see more collaborative teaching and learning. Because you cannot teach people in silos and then expect them to take that mindset to go to industry and all of a sudden they become wonderful collaborators. Collaboration is a yes. mindset. So and that to- might, as you say as well, that might uh, mean that we have to look and seek for collaboration even outside the built environment domain. Oh, definitely. One of the challenges I think we've had with COVID-19 is that, um, rightly or wrongly, a lot of people who have influence the policy have come from medical background, epidemiology background. I don't think the built environment professionals were necessarily involved, which is why some of the um, leading professional bodies like the CAMBAC, which is Society for Ventilation Engineers in Scandinavian Scandinavian countries, ASHWE, VREVA in Europe, they've all come up with strong statements. I think even SIPSI, they've all come up with strong statements saying, look, do not underestimate the importance of the built environment in this narrative of COVID-19. Yes. Most times when people talk about, oh, wash your hand, don't touch your face, that's a medical side of things. Do you understand my point? Correct. But you see, my argument, whether it's controversial or not, is that once a virus leaves the body, it is not just a medical problem. In fact, it's more of an environmental problem than it's a medical problem. You need indoor environmental people, especially building physicists and and, and indoor air quality people to deal with that problem. Because, I mean, with all due respect to medical people, what does the doctor know about a virus? suspended in the air. That's a HVAC issue. That's the ventilation issue. That when you include epidemi- epidemiology, that does not mean we mm. don't need the doctors in opinion because obviously it came out of a human being. But when you ignore the built environment professional or the HVAC people, indoor air quality people, you are making a mistake, fatal mistakes as we've seen in my opinion. So if, let's say, uh, we wanted to learn more about the impact of the physical spaces and the spread of these types of particles and to better understand how the physical spaces can also impact on the spread of the virus, where would you recommend that one might start with scientific resources or any other professional bodies? What type of information is available out there? Okay. I will, I will encourage um, the audience uh, to start with the professional bodies. They've come up with some very, very important guidelines and statements and, 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 and suggestions and policy, no, not policy, uh, recommendations. I'm talking about CIPSI, Chartered Institute of Business Service Engineers in the UK. If you're in the US, you want to look at ASHRAE, they've come up with some very, very important guidelines and statements. RIVA uh, is equivalent of ASHRAE, but it's European based, and SCAMBAC is Scandinavian based. And I'm sure there are probably something similar going on in the Asian world, but I'm talking about the Europe and Western world right now. So those are the first point of call for professionals, for example, who are interested in how the built environment might contribute or alleviate into the spread of some of these things we're worried about. This is a starting point. Um, But then again, for those who are a little bit academic, I would encourage them to, you know, go in research. The information is out there. There's a wealth of information. I just told you people have researched into how consonants, P's and C's, can dictate how a virus might spread from someone in the mouth, who's talking, you know, from their mouth. You know what I mean? People have got to that level of granularity, and yet we keep hearing, oh, we don't have evidence. No, we have a lot of evidence. It's just that in my opinion, and this is why I like I write LinkedIn articles. I've made a policy since I finished my PhD. Whatever research I do, I want to put it out there for a layman to understand because unfortunately, a lot of knowledge is trapped in academic language. This yes. is the biggest problem facing policymakers. A lot of knowledge that can help us become better in society, not just about COVID in general, is trapped in a language that the average person cannot understand. It's useful, it makes impact, but only within, generally within academia, maybe a few people who do R&D. The people who work at Dyson, for example, somebody I respect a lot, they do research and design and development into things like um, uh, vacuum cleaners and fans and the rest of that. They will read publications by academics, even though they, Dyson is not an academic person, isn't it? Correct, yes. That's because they do R&D. Those who do uh, maybe some high-level consulting work or big contractors who do certain kind of high-level work might be interested in some certain things that are happening. But the general public, the general professional out there is oblivious that there's quite a lot of knowledge out there. 
that they can benefit from. You know, when I was, I remember one day when I was making a presentation in Skipton House, uh, London, doing my PhD, I was addressing nurses and doctors and a few other professionals about my research, which was about um, hospital spaces. And I was using the Great Ormond Street Hospital as an example. And I started with this statement, which some, which some people found a bit controversial. I said, when the architect is designing the next hospital, he does not necessarily read the Journal of Infection Control. And some people thought, why would you say that? I said, but it's true, because I'm an architect, I know. We don't mm-hmm. necessarily need the Journal of Infection Control to find out what state of the art about infection control. It yes. puts us down into a policy or a guideline or a recommendation by SIPSI or the NHS or whatever, then we will follow it. But then again, the time it takes for some of this research to trickle down and be used by the general public, it, it, it's probably too lengthy. You know, There's a lot that a professional can learn by just being you know, up to speed with current thinking without waiting for policy. Like I said, certain things are just common sense. You don't need to wait for government policy to know that face mask is useful. You don't need government policy to tell you to stay at home for self-isolation. Do you need government to tell you to eat three times a day? No. You don't need a guideline, you don't need a policy, you don't need a law. So when we wait for things to be codified, we're making a mistake, in my opinion, because a lot of us can be better off by just learning and, and the same way we benefit when we read the news or we watch the news, you know what I mean? We learn better about the world and how things are working. That's how also when it comes to scientific knowledge and being better professionals, we can we can learn by you know going out of our comfort zones. I don't think the professional societies have a role to play in terms of how they design their CPD programs to encourage the, the HVAC designers to take more CPDs in architecture. Architects, AI, the REBA, the AIs, to encourage architects to take uh, uh, short courses in, in HVAC or in other fields, even in epidemiology, for goodness sake. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. When you talk to professionals in the built in, in about, about things like airborne infection, you find out that the medical people have a different mindset to the built environment people. But we're all trying to deal with the same problem. It's just that it's a problem at different periods, you know. For the medical people, it's more about health of the body, the mind, and the soul, and all that. But for the engineering people, it's all about, you know, what happens in the air and all that and how people might be infected, you know. But you see, there's a crossover. There's a healthy crossover that can happen that can enrich the quality of our life and the quality of our, of our places of living and, and habitation. And I, I like to see a lot of that going on. But you see, it's going to be a struggle because of the old mindset we've had. And this is why sometimes BIM is struggling itself today. It's going to be a struggle because, you see, people have been trained and they practice a certain way for many years. Yes. It can only change through generational change. You know what I mean? The millennials would probably think a little bit differently when it comes to digital collaboration, for example, than some older people. So, but that is why it's, it, it's, it's, it's pertinent that we start to invest in this future generation today by changing the way we teach them. You can't keep teaching people the old way. They say the definition of insanity is to do the same thing and expect a different outcome. That's right, yeah. When you graduated with old ways of designing, it's, it's not the time for you to go into industry and start learning, oh, no, oh, really? I need to work with the QS? Why do you think we have, as, a, as somebody who's in built environment as myself, if you've been to site meetings, they can be adversarial, isn't it? Yeah, in some instances. In some instances, they can be adversarial because, you know, everyone's trying to protect their turf. We're forgetting that we are all about the project. It's not about us. It's about the pro- project, the client and the builder and the end users. But we protect our turf because we were trained to um, think in a particular way. So obviously you have a lot of experience within the research domain, but also within practice from what you've discussed and in the education. So based upon everything that you've seen to date with your own research and working with other researchers, is there any advice that you would give to early career researchers entering into our domain and trying to make a difference or change within the built environment? Okay, yeah, I think one advice I'll give will be don't get swallowed in your own bubble. If you write a wonderful research article that's published that has 10,000 people citing it, think about what that impact really means. It just means that 10,000 people who probably think like you, who work in the same domain, who are quoting you. They might not even be necessarily saying you are, what you're saying is right. What I'm saying is that don't get carried away by just academic impact alone. Go out there in the real world and try to make a difference, especially if you're involved in well, not especially if you're involved in any sector, I think you should go out in the real world. I am of the opinion that every academic should be required, required to spend maybe a couple of weeks every year in industry. Refresh your memory. The things yeah. you learn, the, the things you research about might not necessarily be what is playing out out there. Especially in this day and age when knowledge is tripling or doubling every year, like they say. What you think is state of the art is useless in six months because we've gone beyond that. You'll find many people... Um, and this is why academics need, or early career researchers need to go out there. 
you, when you have an, a wonderful idea, all right, and you, you give me some funding, 200,000 pounds or whatever to do the research that idea, it takes maybe a couple of years to hire some research assistants, you come up with some findings and you publish in a journal. In that two years period, probably maybe some of the findings will come out with maybe outdated because the world is moving at such a fast pace now. You know what I mean, Erika? It's what would be the solution then? Is it to do more applied research together with industry? More applied research is necessary, but also we need to have what I call the um, startup mindset. What would that be? A startup mindset for the researcher? Let me put it this way. If I had some money right now and I want to invest it in the next generation of face mask, I have a choice. I could go and find an academic and throw, give him 500,000 pounds or I could find a startup company and give him 500,000 pounds. Who do you think will hit the market quicker? Yeah, I think the answer is evident. So I want academic. I'm not saying academics cannot do a good job. They can do a wonderful job, very intellectually sound job, but they need to have the startup mindset. Do not be confined into thinking, oh, I just need to do this, come up with a four-star journal paper, I'll be cited, whatever. But think about real-world impact. And you can only do that if you work with real-world people in real-world situations. Don't be carried away and live in your own bubble and just want to get papers out there because they say publish or perish. Papers are wonderful. But make sure your papers, first of all, involve industry people. And also, please, goodness sake, I think every academic should have a blog. Where every paper you are writing, if you can go back in history, go every paper you write as from today, write it in a way that the bricklayer or the bus driver or the nurse or the cook will understand. Because if these people can understand it, certainly I think our politicians will understand what you've written. Because there's just too much interesting knowledge that could have helped us in COVID 19, but it's trapped in uh, academic journals. And I just want to challenge anyone to go to Google. Scholar, it's not a normal Google, it's a scholar, for, um, it's, a, it's a Google search engine for academic work. Go to scholar.google.com and just type airborne infection in quotes and just filter it for the next last 10 years. And if you like, you can put pandemic flu as another keyword. You'll be amazed the findings that have been uh, that have, have emerged. And it makes you wonder why people talk about we need more evidence. Yes, we need more, always need more evidence, but you can always start from the past. We don't have, always have to work with new evidence. If the old evidence can work, why not? Thank you for tuning in to listen to Beyond BIM podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more from our latest episodes, then you can visit Beyond BIM, which is available on SoundCloud and iTunes and all the other major podcast providers.